I'm sure that in 20 years, there will either be very large transaction volume or no volume. Satoshi Nakamoto. Welcome to EOS Weekly. Imagine if a single person was able to push a button and bring down all of the dApps running on top of EOS. Or not quite as bad as this scenario, but almost. What if this was divided into five parts? where each of five people had the power to bring down their own corresponding segment of the app population. Believe it or not, this is the current state of EOS. The app builders have become heavily reliant on a small group of only five block producers in order to run their apps. And those five block producers that they are reliant on are Graymass, EOS Sweden, Crypto Lions, EOS Tribe, and EOS Canada. So what's different about these five BPs that makes them so crucial to the EOS network? The answer is that these five are the only BPs running full history API nodes, meaning that they are the only ones storing the entirety of the EOS blockchain on their servers and indexing it all so as to make the data queryable to the dApps. Many people have been under the impression that this was something that all block producers did, that they all stored the full chain on their servers. But what's been happening is that the longer the chain gets, the more expensive and more technically demanding it becomes to store the chain in its entirety. In the beginning, back when the chain was only a few blocks long, it was easy to store the full chain and all the BPs did. But over time, more and more BPs have been dropping out of the full history club here. November turned out to be a tipping point. That was when the chain reached one and then two terabytes in size, nearly doubling in about a month's time. When the chain started hitting this size range, a good portion of the BPs started pulling out. They had to stop offering full history. It was just becoming too technically burdensome and too expensive to keep it going. Today, the chain stands at approximately four terabytes, slightly more or less depending on which of our full history BPs you ask. They are each running different software to store their data, so we've heard the current blockchain size is being anywhere from 3.5 to 5 terabytes. For some of these BPs, maintaining a full history node is already the most expensive part of their operation. For others, it's close. Running the actual block producer nodes is currently up there in the rankings in terms of expenses. Requests coming in from the apps querying the blockchain data tend to follow the 80-20 rule, where 80% of the requests are for recent history and only 20% of the requests require a full history lookup. But unfortunately, those 20% of the requests are essential to keeping most of the apps running. This is why these five BPs are shouldering a disproportionate amount of the network traffic, where each one has essentially become a single point of failure for those apps that are running on top of them. Now, while it is doubtful that any of these BPs would ever do anything malicious, doubtful that they would intentionally bring down their segment of the apps, it is a realistic concern that one or more of these BPs might shut down operations for business reasons, or that they might go down accidentally due to technical issues. If we were to permanently lose another one of our full history nodes, regardless of the reason, that would put even more pressure, even more of a burden on the remaining four, potentially triggering a cascading effect. This is currently EOS's greatest vulnerability and it sort of feels like it snuck in through the back door. While we were watching for attack vectors and for single points of failure up here through the lens of governance, our greatest vulnerability snuck in through the engineering and the economics angle down here instead. So how did we get here? How did we get to this point where we've become so reliant on such a small number of block producers for this essential service? Well, if we trace it back, the main culprit is speed. As we all know, EOS is the fastest blockchain out there, adding new blocks to the chain every half a second. Compare this to Bitcoin at a block every 10 minutes or Ethereum at a block every 15 seconds. Bitcoin's been chugging along for a decade now and the chain size is just over 200 gigabytes. Ethereum for three and a half years and they're at 140 gigabytes. Along comes EOS and due to its speed, in only eight short months we're already at four terabytes. Extrapolate this out a decade to the age that Bitcoin is currently. We don't know how fast the chain will grow, but if we are successful and start getting some mass adoption apps, the chain is only going to grow at an accelerated pace from here. 
What this means is that EOS will be paving the way when it comes to blockchain storage solutions. We're going to be the first to encounter some serious obstacles in this area. But arguably, the bigger challenge might not be an engineering one, but more of an economics one. Google already indexes data on the scale of hundreds of thousands of terabytes. Some estimate it's more in the millions of terabytes. So we can follow in the footsteps of the tech giants to some extent when it comes to storing and indexing massive amounts of data. But the question is how we go about funding it. How do we direct enough revenue towards those BPs who are running these full history nodes so that they can afford all the hardware and the personnel needed to operate and maintain this massive amount of data, this massive amount of ever-growing data? So far, we've failed at adequately funding this group of BPs here. Most of these BPs who are running full history nodes are not even in the top 21. So most are only getting the standby BP revenue. Down the road, as the chain continues to grow, it's doubtful that even our top BPs would be earning enough from block rewards alone to be able to afford to store the full history of the chain and make it queryable to the dApps. Because basically, the token price would need to go up at a similar pace, keeping up with the blockchain size. This would be phenomenal for all of us EOS token holders if this were to actually happen, but let's be realistic here. The token price hasn't gone up with the blockchain size so far, and we can't count on this going forward either. Some have suggested sharding could help, where slices of the history are divided out among different BPs to share, so that the burden, the financial and the technical burden, doesn't fall entirely on a small subset of the BPs like it does today. Another option, though, is to charge dApps for accessing the full history API nodes. Let the dApps, the ones who are utilizing the service, let them help pay for the storage costs. This is what EOS Canada is doing. EOS Canada offers the Diffuse service. Diffuse is a closed source data as a service model. DApps will pay EOS Canada for the right to access the Diffuse API, which offers full history with a powerful query language. This makes a lot of sense in that EOS Canada will be able to use the revenue coming in from their subscribers to pay for maintaining their full history service. Along these same lines, there's another option, and it's that we use Liquid Apps. The Liquid Apps DAP network here will be launching sometime soon. And full history could be the perfect service for a DSP to offer, where we'd move the responsibility from the BPs down here to the DSPs up here. Take Graymass, for example. Graymass could move operations up here to a DSP node. Then they could set up the service agreement on their DSP so as to require a certain amount of DAP tokens be staked to the Graymass DSP node in order for those apps to access their API. This way, with increased usage of their full history service, they'd get increased revenue as well. Currently, Graymass isn't getting this type of deal as a block producer. It's not an option for them down here. All right, now, aside from the cost issue, the other issue with these full history nodes is the lack of standardized APIs. Being that these BPs are all using different software to index and store all the blockchain data, they end up with different APIs for the dApps to connect to. They return data in various formats. These three here all have similar APIs. The history plugin and the MongoDB plugin offer similar endpoints and return data in similar formats. But Diffuse and the Elasticsearch APIs are different from these and different from each other. Now, if an app wanted to connect to two or more of these BPs at the same time for the sake of redundancy, it is possible to do this right now, but it's not very easy to do it. So far, we've only heard of one app that is connected to two separate BPs like this, and that is the Blocks.io Block Explorer. They're connected to both Graymass and to Crypto Alliance. But the vast majority of these apps are only connected to one of these full history nodes. This is why, as we described earlier, any of these five BPs going down would cause app outages. So for the sake of redundancy, we need to make it as easy as possible for apps to move from one BP to another, or from one DSP to another once the DAP network launches. So how do we go about standardizing the interface so that there's more consistency across all these nodes, making it easier for apps to move around? EOS42 has been showing a lot of leadership in this area. In this post here, they announced a new initiative where they are working with the voter proxies to pool votes together and then use those pooled votes to incentivize BPs to deliver certain projects. This is a fascinating idea 
and we plan to cover this in detail in future episodes. But the reason why we mention it here is because of the item at the top of their list. The very first thing that they are pooling votes for is an open source full history solution, one that'll have a standardized API. This should help put everyone's mind at ease at least a little bit, knowing that the BPs are fully aware of these issues with full history and that they're taking steps to address them. EOS Rio, EOS Tribe, EOS Laomao, and Attic Lab have all been working on solutions centered around Elasticsearch and coming up with a standard API for Elasticsearch nodes. One or more of these BPs will likely be involved in the EOS 42 vote pooling program. And Graymass is another obvious frontrunner for the EOS 42 initiative. They are the ones who created the Light History plugin, which has enabled several BPs to continue running history nodes, but where it's configurable so as to only store recent history. Graymass has been the largest contributor towards making these types of customizations to the Native History plugin, which is the original solution provided by Block One. So they bring a tremendous amount of expertise to the table when it comes to anything related to these full history nodes. And last but certainly not least, there's the state history solution that Todd Fleming from Block One has been working on. Several BPs have named state history as the ideal future solution. It's allegedly going to be more robust, easier to sync and maintain, and it will handle temporary forks in the chain better than any of the other solutions that we have so far. This is another project that EOS 42 has been involved in. They've been building out the API for the state history plugin, and EOS 42 is also working together with Block Matrix to offer state history snapshots. This would enable other BPs to stand up state history nodes more easily. These are significant advancements which put this state history solution ahead of the pack. And as we conclude here, one of the most interesting parts of this whole story that we wanted to highlight real quick is the way that BPs are collaborating to solve the full history issues. Block producers are officially competing with one another for votes and ultimately for revenue. And yet they all recognize that the better EOS does as a whole, the better they will do individually. It's a fascinating dynamic to watch in action and it's commendable how well they're coordinating activities in a decentralized way. Keep in mind that there's no corporate ent entity overseeing operations here. All this behavior is emergent. And when it comes to our full history story, this isn't even close to being over. Full history storage is like a subplot in the grander story of EOS, and this particular subplot is dramatic and fast-paced, with a lot of twists and turns coming ahead. If you'd like to follow along with this saga in real time as it unfolds, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. That's it for this week's episode. We appreciate you watching and hope you found this content informative. There's further information linked in the show notes below if you'd like to learn more about the full history issue as well as its solutions. Thanks, and we'll see you next week, right here on EOS Weekly.